Welcome to the Preparing Future Faculty event on Thinking About Career, Reflections from the Field. We're excited to have you join us for this interactive PFF event. And it's being hosted today as a partnership between the PFF program, the ODU Graduate Student Organization, the Office of Graduate Studies, and the National Association of Graduate Professional Students Southeast Regional Conference. On behalf of all of the program organizers, I welcome you and I thank our panelists for being here. My name is Wee Youssef. I am the chair of the Preparing Future Faculty Steering Committee and I'm excited to have you all here. Um, our goal for this event is to provide you with an exposure to a wide range of careers beyond what typical graduate students will think about it in terms of just a tenure track academic position. So we'd like to help you think about a little bit broader about career options as you contemplate whether or not a tenure track position is the right fit for you. Um, this event will have two parts. First, we will have a short 20 minute panel conversation about career exploration. And then we get to the fun part where um, you're already sitting in your groups and the panelists will rotate LSB networking and give you a, the opportunity to have one on, well not one on one, but small group on one conversations with the panelists. Um, you'll have 10 minutes per panelist and so the panelists will make their rounds. As they answer questions um, during the panel discussion, kind of keep some of your questions, think about what you might want to ask and then you'll have the opportunity to do so. Um, so before we begin the panel discussion, I would like to introduce the panelists and we'll actually go in somewhat alphabetical order mm -hmm. since I'm not sure I actually got everything in alphabetical order. Mm -hmm. But I'll start with Abby Braitman, who received her PhD in Applied Experimental Psychology in 2012 from ODU. She currently has a grant from NIH that funds her postdoctoral fellowship. So any of you who are thinking about pursuing a postdoc, Definitely ask Abby about her experience. She'd be more than happy to talk to you about her experience. And she's had this position for the past year and a half. She also occasionally teaches classes in the ODU psychology department as an adjunct assistant professor. Next to Abby is Elif Guler, who is a full-time non-tenure track instructor of rhetoric and writing in um, Old Dominion University's English department. She has a BA in International Relations from Koch University in Istanbul, Turkey, and an MA and PhD in Rhetoric and Professional Writing Studies from ODU. She is also a graduate of the PFF Certificate Program. Um, she has been teaching courses in Writing and Rhetoric since the fall of 2007, first as a graduate instructor and then as a full-time instructor. So she'll be able to give you kind of the instructor perspective as well. Um, Brian Payne, who is joining us while he eats his lunch, <laughs> is Vice Provost for Graduate and Undergraduate Academic Programs here at ODU. He was formerly Chair of Criminal Justice and Criminology at Georgia State University and Chair of the Department of Sociology and Criminal Justice at ODU. He is the author of eight books and more than 160 scholarly journal articles and is the current President of the Academy of Criminal Justice Science. And Brian will be more than happy to talk to you about the tenure track path and the administrative roles at, within the university setting. So keep those kinds of questions in mind for him as well. Shelly Rodrigo is not a new face to those who have attended PFF workshops. She is assistant professor of rhetoric and new media here at ODU. Before coming to ODU, she was a full-time faculty member for nine years at Mesa Community College in Arizona. In addition, she is actively engaged in how newer technologies better facilitate communicative interactions, more specifically teaching and learning. So any questions about community colleges and teaching intensive types of positions, Shelley's your girl. And finally, Tansy Vandekar Burden, oh, and Emily, <laughs> is the Associate Director of the Social Science Research Center here at ODU. The center specializes in survey research and Tansy is responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the center as well as for supervising the SSRC research assistants and other staff. Uh, previous career experiences include a magistrate position with the 4th Judicial District in the city of Norfolk and a residential counselor at a juvenile treatment center. Emily Eddins is not only the last panelist <laughs> from my list, obviously out of alph alphabetical order, but is also the newest uh, of the panelists to be here at ODU. 
She is the Assistant Director of Service Learning, which is located within the Division of Student Engagement and Enrollment Services, and she joined ODU in January of 2014. She earned a Doctorate in Human Dimensions of Natural Resources from Colorado State University, and her dissertation involved helping to create service learning initiatives in a remote part of Panama. So those of you who might be interested more in student services and working directly with students or service learning, you can t make sure you keep your questions for Emily. So welcome panelists and thank you for taking the time to be here. I'd like to start our panel conversation. Please hold your questions for your one-on-one -on -one sessions with the panelists as they rotate through. I'd like to try and keep the panel discussion a little bit on the short side so that we can actually get into the small group discussions. But my first question for the panelists are, what excites you about your career? And so if you think about answering that question, you can think about your current career path and also past career paths. So who'd like to open up the floor? I, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, uh, everything. I just, uh, I'm just excited about the opportunities there are in higher education, the, uh, op the flexibility, the uh, uh, opportunity for doing things that are different. To, uh, I started as a assistant professor in tenure track job and loved doing that. And then as a department chair, I loved that sometimes. <laughs> and uh, now as an administrator, so far I'm loving it, but I also love that I have the opportunity to still be a faculty member. So it's just, uh, it, it, it's rare that, uh, uh, I think as an administrator, that uh, in, in the business world, they couldn't say, well, once I start to get tired of it, or once I start to bomb, I can always go back and do what I was doing before. You have that in higher education. Emily? Um, so. I was thinking about this question, and actually I've been thinking about it a lot recently just because I am um, just two months in, but my position, um, I get to work with faculty that are all doing, you know, community-based work and service learning in their courses, and so I, I get to know faculty from all of the departments, all, you know, no matter where, where they are, and so that's, I get to hang out with the, you know, with the folks that are doing some really, really cool stuff. And um, and it just and then make connections between those and and um, and I just I really I like that a lot. I've had a, a lot of really I get to have a lot of really great conversations all the time. Okay. And I actually still have the opportunity to um, to teach as well. I'm gonna think hopefully become adjunct in um, one, of, one of the departments here on campus too. Chancy. Yeah. Building on Emily, uh, our. Um, the department that I work for, the center that I work for, we do, we interact a lot with faculty too and we do research, we help them, we help the faculty do their research and while they're the content expertise, they bring the content expertise to the research, we bring the methodological expertise and so even though my background is in public administration and the social sciences, we've done survey research or help faculty with survey research from everything from teleworking practices to oral cancer and alcohol use, um, you know, so we, we get to learn a lot about a lot of different things and so that's very exciting. It's very, also very uh, rewarding to know that you're bringing a, a skill set to their research that they either don't have or don't have the time to do or don't have the resources to do and so that is, is very exciting for me as well. Abby or um, I really enjoy the training opportunities and gaining new skill sets that I get through my postdoc. Um, the point of most postdocs is to get a little more hands-on training, um, a little more field experience, or a little more research experience before you step into a completely independent job. Um, so I still have mentors I can turn to, but I am running my own research lab, conducting my own studies, um, so it's a really nice stepping stone toward independence while still having people I can turn to for help when I need help or um, generate ideas when, when I'm struggling with a particular concept. Um, so it's really nice to get some of that hands-on training and that field experience, but still in a somewhat sheltered environment. <laughs> um, so I'm definitely talking about uh, my time at the community college, and there the most exciting thing was just social justice, that um, most of the students that are coming to the community college for a variety of reasons are not coming to an institution like ODU first. And ODU actually has a very diverse student population um, and it actually, the diversity, when I came here, I specifically compared it to the diversity of the institution I came from and 
it looked relatively similar, which was one of the reasons I liked coming here. Um, but the opportunity to work with students who, if these institutions did not exist, they would not be able to go to school. A lot of them are first generation students in higher education. Um, and so that ability to work with them. Uh, but then also the challenge to be really um, blunt about it, the challenge of also working with student populations that um, sometimes we call them underprepared. Other times it's because they're working full time and have families and are trying to take classes on top of it. Um, and so if you were not a good teacher before moving into a community college environment, you will become one when you were there. I mean, for me as an instructor, it's just basically the act of teaching a classroom. Uh, it was kind of throughout my academic life. I, I was a, you know, when I was a master's student, when I was a doctoral student, um, I always liked the teaching aspect of what I was doing because academic life kind of, you know, it involves writing research, it might involve service, it might involve some other types of work that you are doing, but re teaching was always kind of the uh, favorite part for me because Writing and research, for example, can be an isolated experience sometimes, but teaching allows me to interact with students. It uh, allows me to work with students on their interests and convey my knowledge and experience to them. Uh, and it's also uh, building on what Brian Payne was say saying. Uh, in, the, in, in the academia, there's that flexibility. I like that flexibility, especially also in the classroom, because um, I can create, for example, useful and fun assignments for students and uh, it kind of there's more of that I guess in in academia in the in the teaching space probably more than some other types of workplaces you can do uh, different things you can do creative things with your students watch watch what they do with that with uh, those assignments or projects that uh, you are helping them kind of complete so I like that flexibility and just the act of teaching a classroom Okay, so let's think about then, we have a whole room full of graduate students thinking about future careers. What factors have you or would you consider in exploring and deciding on your career path? <laughs> um, I'll say that my position is a very unique position and that it's not permanent. It's a one to three year fellowship at the vast majority of places you'll look at. Um, so I still am looking for my permanent career. Um, so in this particular instance, it's really nice to get more training and I'm still considered entry level then when I apply for jobs. So I'm competing with people that just got their PhD, but I've had additional years of experience and training and that shows on my Vita. So looking at somebody fresh out of their dissertation and looking at me, who maybe I got six more publications and some more conference presentations during my fellowship. Um, it allows me to be a little choosier with my final career because hopefully I'm getting more offers than some of my counterparts that chose not to go through the additional training. Are you I too did PFF at, at the institution where I got um, my PhD and um, one of the requirements was to, to go and actually to do time, if you will, go spend time at different types of institutions. And I can't stress enough how useful that was to me. That, that's what uh, allowed me to even consider uh, teaching at the community college and I was very happy there. Um, so if you have the opportunity to go spend time at different types of institutions, please do so. Um, and usually faculty at those institutions, are, uh, people are excited to talk about whatever it is they do. And so if, if you ask them to talk about what they do or ask them to allow you to shadow for a day so you can get a sense of the student population, what it is they do outside of the classroom, all of that, just to understand that there are differences between institutions, both types of institutions and even at similar institutions. You know, one community college and another community college are nowhere near alike. Other thoughts? I kind of agree with um, Abby or building on what Abby said, financial concerns probably will always be one of the first things to consider because it's kind of you have to pay the bills first. So uh, it was my concern actually when I, when I uh, applied to become an instructor a couple of years ago. I was a doctoral student in my fourth year at the time and uh, I wasn't, that was the kind of last year of financial support I was going to get. So at the time, English department uh, announced this to non-tenure line uh, um, 
appointments. And at the time, I was kind of also thinking about considering to go on the job market for tenure track positions. Uh, but I was still working on my dissertation. I still needed to continue my doctoral studies. And again, I didn't have any financial support to fall back on. So I applied for this job. It was kind of what was ahead of me. And I guess focusing on what's ahead of you, kind of trying to see what is available right now rather than obsessing with at the time I was really like I, I want a tenure track job right away but the reality was that I was I still needed time I still needed some financial support so uh, instructorship was the best option at the time and, and, and I, I'm sorry no, I was going to add to that that uh, well, well, I, well I say that one of the best parts of uh, being a professor and administrator in education is uh, flexibility <laughs> I think in a career, you also have to be flexible yourself in your, especially your early career. I ended up in a job that uh, it wasn't as a child the place that I would have dreamed of living. It wasn't the place I ever wanted to live before. And uh, I ended up there and it was, it was a good experience. But uh, had I set myself into a particular path and said, I will never live in this particular area, uh, the trajectory would have been completely different. So. Uh, we need to keep open minds in our career searches. Uh, we, we need to do what's best for us, not what's best for our faculty advisor or our department that we're working in. It's about your own quality of life and how you want to balance your quality of life with your career. You make that decision, and, and that decision will change over time. Yeah. Michelle, you had something to add. Uh, and sometimes it's both where you might be willing to go or if, for example, your location locked for whatever reason that you have to stay within the region, you're currently getting your degree, that's when being open to different types of institutions or different types of positions within those institutions becomes critical um, because that, that's where those positions are going to exist. Yeah. yeah, even though the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, you may find that your career path it has a couple of turns in it. You know, I came into my position having a master's degree and coming from working, at, you know, kind of in uh, um, the public sector um, and coming back to the university and then getting my PhD while I was working here in the center and now in a job that's not tenure track. Um, but if I go back to what I was doing when I was an undergrad and if you'd ask me, well, you know, in however many years you'll be running a research center, I would be like, well, geez, I, I never really thought about doing that, but it's kind of what my dream job would be given what I like to do and what my strengths are. And those, those, those kind of detours that your career path may take you, be willing and open to see them and value them for what they bring. Before I came here, I was uh, working in the public se sector as a magistrate. And when I came to this position, um, I also taught some uh, criminal justice courses. So I was able to bring my real world experience of being a magistrate uh, in the legal system uh, to, the, to that position and, and to my lectures and to my students. Um, and even though there wasn't much of a, a opportunities for advancement in that position, uh, I, do, I do value what that real world experience was able to do for me when I taught those courses. So, yeah. Okay, so, uh, can I go? Oh, go ahead. Um, so, I think the main motivation for why I chose the path that I did um, was kind of built out of um, management and also financial stuff, but also um, kind of frustration a little bit of what I, um, what I had for my dissertation. Like I, you know, you pour your heart and soul into this project and you, you know, know so much about it. And then, and then I really wanted to do something about it. And by that time, my funding had run out and I was fun done with my PhD. And I was like, uh, uh, but I really I just want to go down there and do something. And so I wanted to pursue a path that was really action-based. Um, and so, so that's, that's kind of why I, I chose this. Well, I actually had um, one final question, but I, I really want to kind of get to the interactive portion. Um, so the last thing is for everybody to kind of keep in mind as you discuss in the small groups is what other advice um, our panelists might have to offer you about career exploration. And we also have two senior faculty sitting at this table right here, who would also probably be more than happy and volunteering us, would be more than happy to help to, to, to talk to you about different career options, what to think about, what excites them about their job. Um, and, and they probably mentored a ton of other graduate students. So they're, they're, they have a wealth of experience um, to share with you. So basically, this wraps up the panel discussion.
And I'd like to basically to open it up for the interactive sessions. If you're already sitting, you're already sitting in your, your groups, we'll basically work the panelists around and we have a cowbell. <laughs> when yes. the cowbell More goes cow off, <laughs> the panelists will rotate. So all the students get to sit there. We're kidding. We have and a cowbell. Zach, um, Zach will, will so we'll have basically have about 10 minutes for each panelist. So folks online, um, I think chat is probably what works best because um, the audio in here would start to get overwhelming. Uh, quality of life with uh, teaching, publishing, and, and your home life. It depends on what you're trying to do. So when you're at a teaching institution um, in a full-time position, uh, your tenure or whatever acts as tenure, so let's quickly step back. Depending on the type of institution you're at, a couple things vary. One, how many courses you have. So um, there are teaching institutions that have a 4-4 load. Usually they have a little bit of research requirement. Uh, but then things like community colleges, they usually have anywhere from 5-5, five, five, so that's five classes a semester, or 5-3 credit hour classes. So if you're in the sciences, it's probably less with a little bit larger lecture classes and labs. Um, and uh, so a 5-5 to a 7-7. I actually have a, a colleague who told me last year her institution went to a 7-7. I, I feel for her. I'll, I'll be blunt. Um, but your quality of life, teaching is that your predominant position. You, as a full-time faculty member, you'll have to do service. And unless your institution requires research of some kind, um, usually you're only being required to do some form of professional development. Um, there are community colleges that require a little bit of research or and a lot of times what counts is even just a conference presentation. It's not even um, something that's published. Uh, again, it depends. Um, in terms of balance with home life, ac the academy at large is bad at that. Um, teaching and research are kind of black holes of time in my experience and they will give whatever you will take uh, well, they will take whatever you're, you you give them. Um, so when I was at the community college, I, I finished my PhD, I co-edited uh, a um, an edited collection, and I also co-authored a textbook. Uh, and all of all of that was above and beyond my teaching load. So my work life balance was probably not as good as it could have been. <laughs> I do not have children. Um, uh, but one thing that you you have to learn teaching at um, a community college or another teaching in intensive uh, institution is you have to learn your, to streamline your teaching. There's just no way you can manage it without streamlining it and sometimes actually I think that's a really good lesson to learn. A lot of times when you're only teaching one or two or even sometimes as many as three classes a semester, you will give them a lot of time and when you're teaching five or six classes a semester, you're, you're forced to, to streamline them in ways uh, like grading, as uh, I'm a writing instructor at the end of the day, and so I, I had to learn ways to, to streamline uh, grading. Um, but like a lot of um, mentors online through the Chronicle of Higher Ed, Inside Higher Ed, uh, when they talk about balancing work and life, you, you have to schedule life. You have to make sure that you make it a part of your schedule, and you have to prioritize it. And if you choose to continue research at a teaching-focused institution, which I obviously did, or I wouldn't have been able to transition to ODU in a tenure track line, um, you have to prioritize that. So um, I'm not saying work-life balance is easy. I'm saying, though, you have to be committed to it to make it balanced. Stephanie, I hope that answered some of that. The short answer is it's not easy, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I see Marty's typing, or I don't know. If she... Ah, was the adjustment difficult? Um, <laughs> what's interesting is uh, what who I call my partner in scholarly crime. She made that jump about three, four years before I did, and about two years in, she goes, "You know, Shell, I, I don't have any more time for research than I did when I was at the community college." And surprisingly, it's it's kind of the same. What being in a tenure track position at a research institution, it just forces me to prioritize my research and writing in a way that at the community college, if I went six, eight weeks without doing any of that, my you know my world would not end. I would not get fired. Um, uh, so things things that were 
a, a little difficult in the shift. Um, I wasn't prepared for the the preparation workload in upper division, especially teaching graduate classes. Um, they're just it's a lot more meaty material. I wasn't quite prepared for that. I've been teaching you know 100 and 200 level undergrad classes for almost a decade, actually for over a decade. Um, I I wasn't. Th this is actually, and it's, it, it it took me two and a half years to get to this point. I think I had to be here long enough. I spent a lot of time writing letters of recommendation. Not that I didn't occasionally write a letter of recommendation at the community college, but I just didn't get called upon that in the way that I do here. Um, so it's just this, you know, weird little um, side portion of the job that I realize that I have to do now, and it requires time. Um, I find students at the four-year institution, and whether they're undergraduates or graduate students, um, they come to my office hours more. At the community college, those students are very transient in various, in all the ways you can imagine the term. And, and so my office hours, I had to hold them, but very rarely did students actually come to them. And most of the time, because they were working, if students really needed to meet with me, we had to schedule time anyways, because we had to work around their work schedule and my schedule. I actually held a lot of meetings at like Starbucks on the weekend, because that's what worked for both of us. Not suggesting you have to do that, that's just what worked for me. Marty, does that help with some of that? And hopefully Amanda's got a question coming. Other questions? Other? Um, one thing I also did, um, I did a lot of professional development. So I, I worked the, my last four years, five years, four years. At the community college, I spent various amounts of reassigned time for our center in teaching and learning. And so I actually, I was prepared for working with graduate students because I had been mentoring and facilitating workshops for my colleagues in our center for teaching and learning. Amanda, I see your question. Um, Amanda, you'll be an adjunct professor in economics before starting your PhD. Good, so teaching experience before. Your children are almost grown, so I want to wait as I will be leaving the state for my degree. Any advice you have? Uh, okay, so I'm just going to repeat this back and make sure I have it. You you are waiting to start your PhD until your children are done and grown and out of the house? Yes. Yes, that is a good idea because it allows for a couple things. One, it allows you to be flexible where you go for your PhD. So you can apply to more places you're willing to move. And two, if if after you get your PhD, if your goal is to become a professor in higher ed, um, you'll probably be more flexible and willing to move, um, or you're just you're not restricted by your children and their um, wants and needs. So I, I had I had a few graduate school classmates who had high school age children, and that that was very restrictive for them. And one one she moved, she finished her PhD and moved her daughter. Um, mid high school so the daughter had finished sophomore year and, and started junior year and that was a very very rough move um, the teenage daughter was not happy um, and I'm not sure if I'm saying this Selene I hope I said that right you're planning for applying for a tenure track position in a state university system well the community college I was at was in it was a community college system but it was one of the larger ones in the nation along the sides of Miami-Dade so Maricopa Community College in Phoenix um, a lot of times so you've got a variety of things going on um, a lot of times when you're within a system your curricular decisions are not locked to your institution um, and sometimes that's interesting. Um, a lot of times your your faculty governance policies are also institutional wide. Now, um, with a CC in a state university system, that could be problematic with faculty governance and especially tenure and promotion because have they set up this the policy to account for the fact that you're in a teaching focused institution or is the policy privileging the research? So I'd be very clear on um, what your tenure and promotion guidelines, or even if they call it tenure, uh, but your your promotion guidelines within that system to make sure it accounts for the institution you're at, not at the the um, the big schools, if that makes sense. Okay, I just got the cowbell, so someone will be coming over here.
Thank you. And if you have other questions, please feel free to email me. I'm rrodrigo at odu.edu. Okay. Okay, everybody. This is Emily Evans. Hi. And Emily um, will basically talk to the camera. Okay. Um, they'll post their their. We don't have them hooked oh. up, so they will type their questions, oh, and all great. you have to do is respond. Okay. So. Sounds good. All right, everybody. Does anybody have any questions for Emily? And just let me refresh that Emily is the brand new um, service learning coordinator here at ODU. So she works directly with students and directly with faculty. It's a different kind of a faculty position. It is, yeah. So Selene is asking. Um, so I actually, sure, okay. So I actually work in the um, Office of Leadership and Student Involvement. So, um, so I am technically more of an administrative. Um, okay, for some of the previous questions. So I'm, I'm technically a, an administrative position right now, um, rather than. But I'm considered faculty staff, and so I'm starting to. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to. look at the previous question. So um, here I see the, what would you say your quality of life is, um, aka the balance um, between teaching, publishing, and your home life. And um, so that's actually a really big reason, I guess, why I chose my position. Um, you know, when I was really considering what I wanted to do, um, I started interviewing faculty and, and you know, those, those faculty that I that I really admire and you know um, teaching I guess learning about their experience a little bit more um, and uh, honestly I didn't really get the best response <laughs> like they um, you know as a junior faculty you're really really busy and um, you know I wanted to kind of choose a path that I could that I actually could leave at five so um, uh, <laughs> and so um, that was kind of a, a motivation for me. But also, I wanted um, I wanted to be able to have a little bit um, more flexibility. And so I would say my, my quality of life in my position right now is is pretty high, um, and, and and it's really fun. Um, so, but also, you know, I I do have the opportunity to to teach and to publish, and you know, I still have those. Um, those yeah those opportunities to do so so um, does that does that help should I keep going through the um, the other questions that were previously asked okay so um, a little bit about my job description what I do is um, primarily work with faculty to incorporate um, community service into the coursework and uh, and particularly, um, you know, to support and um, provide resources for those for those faculty that are that are doing service learning in their courses, and also um, also community based research and community engaged scholarship as well. So, kind of being that link between the faculty and the um, and the community partners that we have here in Hampton Roads, and also. Um, to help develop um, some even international service learning experiences as well. So um, I'm all over campus. <laughs> I mean, just in the last two months, I have actually already put together a service learning task force um, with 14 different faculty that are either already um, working with or implementing service learning into their coursework or, coursework or are interested in doing so. And so it's already just 14 different faculty from every different college on campus. And so it's really, um, it's a fun conversation to have with, with all of those folks in the same room and working towards similar goals of, of community development. So it's, that's, that's how I, that's how I work with faculty. Thanks. Does anybody else have any questions? Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm if I see myself staying in the 
administrative position for the long term. It's it's really interesting right now because um, something I guess I didn't really foresee was that I um, my my PhD is in human dimensions of natural resources, and I'm in an office full of um, folks that have uh, backgrounds in higher ed, and so I have a little bit of a different <laughs> different perspective and and. Um, you know, I just have been kind of, I was so focused academically for so long, and so now to kind of go to a position um, that is very uh, practice-based and, and, um, and, and administrative, it's just, it's, it's, it's definitely been a big change. I mean, I, I just started two months ago, um, but, but I really, I really enjoy it, and I really love, um, I really love the interdisciplinary uh, aspect of it. I love that I get to know um, of what people are doing all over um, all over the university. So that's that's probably one of my favorite things. And as far as long term, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. We'll see. Um, but for now, I really like it. <laughs> and um, and also, you know, I. I am planning on being um, adjunct, and so yeah, I'll, I'll still have the opportunity to um, to go back to the academic route. I think if I uh, if I want to, so it's kind of um, fun to have that flexibility. I guess. Is there any any other questions? Human, yeah, human dimensions um, of natural resources. So I was at um, Colorado State um, University, and so we have a natural resource college, so forestry and geology and ecology and all of that. And so we were um, basically the social science side of that. So um, it's we, you know, we study how people affect the envir environment and vice versa. And so a lot of my colleagues were doing. Um, work in the national parks and like wildlife, um, human interaction and um, more natural resource management, um, but from a, from a social pr perspective. And so I just, I actually did something like way different than them in the first place anyway, because I, I studied international service learning um, through uh, like ecotourism perspective. So um, I worked with, uh, with um, the Panamanian Center for Research and Social Action and a small ecotourism group in Panama to uh, to do my research. So, it's it's an interesting field, and it's and it, it is inter interdisciplinary in in nature. And I I keep saying that because that's 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 what I um, really enjoy is learning different perspectives um, of similar issues from different fields. Looks like there's a question coming in. <laughs> Cassie Corner at CSU. Um, no, <laughs> I don't. I'm sorry. It's a big, it's a big university. Um, but I did just, just move here. Um, so, type of research tips. Um, research tips. Um, go for what you love. I mean, you know, as far as a dissertation topic, you know, and of course you have to spend uh, a few years, <clears throat> years of your life thinking pretty much just about that. And so, um, really, don't be afraid to be vocal about um, about doing exactly what you want. So. Um, that would be that would be my my recommendation. Um, but it looks like I need to um, move tables. But it was lovely chatting with you, and um, I uh, wish you all the best of luck in this exciting um, in the exciting next steps of your career. So thank you. So basically, there's nothing really to do. The students will type their questions in the chat box. Okay. We have Dr. Elaine Justice from the psychology department. And Elif Guler, let's see.
from the English department. Also, and then from the English department, so she can talk about the instructor okay. experience. And I sort of talk about the difference between that and tenure track. Mm -hmm. So they'll type their questions in the okay. text box. I guess that will be a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, has the tenure track cheated you well, or do you think another path would have served better? No, in my case, tenure track has served me well because I really enjoyed doing the research as well as the teaching. But I came to ODU at a time when, and, and they're, they're still both valued, but there's more an emphasis nowadays on the research and the grant getting. Uh, I'm not sure, I like the balance, so I'm not sure I would uh, would be as good a fit now for the, the emphasis on research and grant writing uh, as, as I was 30 years ago, but um, re review the previous questions and share. Okay. So there's one about job description. Can you tell us a little more about your job description? You want to take that? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm an instructor in the English department, instructor of writing and historical studies. So my job includes for for a four four teaching load. I need to teach four sections of basic and advanced writing and rhetoric courses each semester. Um, so it also has some advising and service responsibilities. We advise about 10 to 15 students each semester on their registration, career goals, and things like that. And then I have to also serve on two committees each semester uh, on issues like uh, related to the field, in the field. So that's kind of what the job entails. And it's a non-tenure track job. It's a, per, it's a temporary job. It can go up to six years. So. Um, yeah, that's the nature of the instructorship at, at, in the English department here. And Elif, I understood you were applying now for Yeah, I have been on the job market, uh, and yeah, right now it's still in process, but uh, I was offered a tenure track job, and uh, I'm kind of in a, in a transitional period now, right now to a tenure track job, and uh, if I was also I was looking for either lectureships or tenure track jobs, and I was kind of lucky to look and land this one. Um, I definitely needed that permanency uh, with the uh, lectureship is something similar to instructorship with more permanency, um, at least in the English department. So I definitely, my job was kind of expiring soon, and I needed to make that transition to a permanent job. So, yeah. Yeah, you really need to think about. I, I think for lectureships, for non-tenured teaching positions, you need to just make sure that that's really what you want to be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, if you love teaching and you're really not crazy about the research part of it, then that's yeah. a good good fit for you. Yeah. And um, you know, really is important to think about what you want. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, I mean, I haven't experienced so many problems about that at ODU, but I have only had several years of experience. I'm not sure if I might have any issues in terms of equal treatment in the future. I hear that too. I hear that there is a difference between the salaries men and women get, although I don't know, as I said, I haven't, I'm not getting a different salary right now as an instructor than a male instructor is getting. Yeah. So. I can probably give a little perspective because I have yeah. been here for yeah. over yeah. 30 years. Right. Uh, I was one of the for cohort of four female PhDs, which were the first PhDs hired in the psychology department. And at that point in time, they were just becoming aware of this gender equity issue. And universities try very hard not to, at least overtly, uh, have those that be an issue. But I can't say that it's not because I'm a psychologist. So yeah. I am well aware of those stereotypes and, and those unconscious kinds of things. And they have something called gender equity analysis, you know, and even though they try to make sure that that raises, for example, are comparable, 
there are cases when it comes up that it's clearly these two individuals seem to be doing about the same thing, they have the same background, number of publications, etc., and yet their salary winds up different somehow or other. So then they try to adjust that, but, uh, you know, you, we aren't a gender-blind society any more than we're a race-blind society. Uh, I can't say it's overt at all. I think perhaps there's a little more expectation for service for female faculty than males, even though it's, you know, nobody's thinking about it deliberately doing it. Um, I think we just interact differently and have different expectations. Not only others to us, but even us for ourselves. Women tend to be more helpful. You know, we're, go we're gonna volunteer when the guys sometimes are right. less likely to. So, to that degree, I think it's still there. Another question, I guess, coming up. You are welcome. Any other questions? Type of okay. research. research. Um, since I am a non-tenure track, track, I'm in a non-tenure track position right now, it doesn't have any research requirements. Um, so I cannot say, uh, because one thing I can say in relation to this, because research is not part of it, you also cannot get research support in an instructor position and you cannot get so much conference travel support. Sometimes when there is kind of leftover budgets, they, and our department chair is really gracious and she's always willing to help if she can, but it really depends on the budget. So there's that aspect in terms of the requirements, tenure track, I'm not so sure. Sometimes uh, I, mean, I hear that it can be up to 12 journal articles or something until you can get your tenure within the six year tenure clock or something, but it really would be best to, of course, check with someone who is actually a tenure track in the English department right now, because research is a requirement for them, but not for instructors and lecturers. I am hoping this, how would you handle that, refers to the, the gender issues. I, it's not real clear on our screen, but I can only say that you should be very sensitive to it during the interview process. If you don't feel comfortable with your colleagues, male and female, then that would certainly raise a red flag. Mm -hmm. I don't think you particularly want to ask in any particular way, but, but just be sensitive to the messages you're getting and, um, you know, know University is going to say, oh, yes, we uh, discriminate, but mm -hmm. uh, you can pick up clues, I think, in the process. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's great advice because I have been on the job market also recently, and during the interviews, you definitely need to kind of watch what people say and try to get, uh, based on what they say, maybe read between the lines, because you definitely also, I think, shouldn't bring up that, and because it might be sort of presumptuous to kind of bring it up is there a difference at your department with me, madam? I don't know. I don't. I wouldn't. I haven't talked about that. And I can say that uh, the conditions, the work conditions that I I was offered, um, they weren't different. They really, I think, valued my background. They they looked at what I'm bringing to the department, and that's how I, they have evaluated the situation. And I, they made a really good offer eventually. I don't think it was, it was even better than some, I know some male male uh, faculty working there. The conditions that they kind of, you know, offered me was even, were even better sometimes in some cases. Uh, but I guess that was the particular in institution. So that was kind of the positive um, aspect of that institution. It might change from institution to institution. And also department to department, because yeah. in, in some, like you're in engineering, you could be the only female, and then you have to be particularly interested in figuring it out. Gender uh issue. -huh. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it certainly would be difficult. And, yeah. you know, I I can't say how absolutely to avoid it, except to yeah. just, just be aware and, and yeah, pick just, up the cues. Just, yeah. to, just to add to Elaine's advice, I would also say you are going to have a campus interview, you know, if you are lucky to kind of pass the phone interview, and you will hopefully meet with some department members at that campus interview. That There you can also kind of try to pick up the cues in terms of 
what kind of uh, institute, institution they are. So. Hello everyone, I'm um, Tansy Vandekar Burden. I'm the Associate Director of the Social Science Research Center uh, on campus here in the College of Arts and Letters. I am a 12-month AP faculty member, which is not a tenure track position. I've been in that position for 15 years. Um, I run a, a research center that um, assists faculty with their research grants, particularly if they need surveys, um, interviews, focus groups. Basically my tagline is, if you need data collected from humans, uh, we can usually help you. Uh, so we help faculty with that. We also work with outside agencies, um, a lot of public and state level agencies, for example, um, were in the midst of a mail survey for the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services um, regarding um, uh, services that uh, infants and toddlers with disabilities have received um, uh, across the state. So, um, so that's what I do, um, and so I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, Stephanie asked, was there anything in particular that made you seek this position rather than a teaching one? Well, I came into this position with just a master's degree. I had finished my master's degree here at the university and I went into the public sector uh, working as a magistrate for the city of Norfolk. Um, and uh, the faculty member that I worked for as a master's student had started the research center had worked to start it up in the College of Arts and Letters and she basically asked me if I'd be willing to come back and help run it. Um, and so I did and um, it was kind of risk because they weren't sure if it was going to take off. Um, but it was very exciting, it was very rewarding to know that for the past 15 years we've been running this research center and it's been great. Um, during the course of um, my past 15 years I've since gotten my PhD while working full-time at the university um, and I've done some teaching I taught in my first year here and I've done some adjunct teaching and I'm actually um, developing a, a survey topics course um, for the um, Department of Public Administration and Urban Studies um, and so since I'm in this position a 12-month position I feel like I can be choosy about what classes I teach and so th this I'm really looking forward to teaching this um, this, uh, this survey course. Um, let's see, uh, very interesting. Do you have experience in grant writing yourself? Um, yes, we, um, with the research center, you know, we will work with faculty who are writing grants to get uh, research dollars to do their own research. Um, but uh, we also um, um, will sometimes apply for our own grants. Um, and so we, I've done some um, proposal writing, often in partnership with either the center's director or with other faculty that, once again, bring that content expertise that, you know, we have the methodological expertise about how to do surveys, how to do focus groups. Um, but then working with faculty who might have that experience in healthcare or um, criminal justice or uh, psychology. Um, what advice do you have for us regarding working or teaching full time while pursuing our PhDs? Oh yes. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see. I started. You know, I had been in my position, my full time position here for probably two or three years when I started the PhD program and I only took a class a semester um, so it was a slow and steady course um, and also you know had a family uh, actually uh, probably a year into it got pregnant with my daughter um, and I guess um, my advice would be um, uh, <laughs> to well obviously get through your coursework but when it comes time for your dissertation you know that's going to be probably the biggest balancing act is you know making time for writing your dissertation and doing your research uh, while trying to hold down a full-time job and possibly have a family and so my advice there would be do something every day whether it's 15 minutes of reading an article 20 minutes of writing you know paragraphs, uh, 30 minutes of looking at your data, if you touch it every day, that will keep the momentum going um, to get through, get that dissertation done, and get that PhD behind your name. And, and that was advice that was given to me. I found it to be found it to be incredibly, incredibly helpful. I could probably count on maybe two hands how many days during that whole process that I didn't do something related to my dissertation and it, by the time, because by the time I was done with my coursework I was at year seven because I only took a course a semester and so 
uh, I was up against the clock to finish within eight years and so that helped me start my dissertation and finish within less than a year and so um, that that would be probably my biggest piece of advice if you're trying to balance you know working on the dissertation and the PhD while you're working full-time and teaching full-time um, and and hopefully you have people in your life who are supportive and will uh, will help you get through that and then that was the case for me but um, yeah so that would be my advice I see Amanda is typing You're welcome. Um, I will be waiting until my boys are 18 so that that way I can focus more. Yeah, I, you know, it seems that even when our children are older, they still need us. But, uh, but um, you know, I, and, I, and I've been told that uh, actually having young children was a good time to work on. Um, work on the PhD, uh, a faculty member when, back in my undergrad told me that. I, I'm not sure I agree with that, but <laughs> everybody's uh, situation is different. Does anybody else have any other questions? Okay, I see someone is typing. Um. Uh, yes, my position is a 12-month contract, um, a full-time. Um, my position actually used to be what was called a soft money position, which meant that with our research dollars, we had to bring in enough money to cover my position. Um, just recently, though, the university has changed that, and I'm now in somebody else's, I'm in a university budget line somewhere else. So, yes, I, I have a 12-month annual contract. Oh, there's, there definitely is, particularly when my position, uh, probably less so now, now that, um, and when, you know, I say a 12-month employee, at this point it just means that I'm not a 9- or a 10-month employee like some, you know, tenure-track faculty are. Um, but prior to the position becoming uh, included in, in the university budget, it was there was a lot of uncertainty, and there were some years, as you can imagine, with the economy where things were definitely tight at the research center, and getting you know research, bringing in research dollars was uh, hard to do. Um, thankfully, we uh, the dean in our college is very has been very supportive, both um, just in general, but also financially. And so some of those years where you know, things were tough, um, he would uh, be our backup plan, and so, you know, those dollars were covered. Um, now there's definitely less uncertainty because I'm now, I'm no, I no longer have to bring in all of those dollars to cover myself. Obviously, we need to bring in dollars to cover other staff um, and to help expand the center, but, um, and, and, you know, it, it was tough. I think I tried not to think about it too much and just work as hard as we could to bring in uh, the, the monies that we needed to do that. Um, uh, and, I, and I think the university has gone away from having faculty sign, uh, AP faculty sign a contract every year. Um, you know, we're, Virginia's an at-will state, so, you know, you always have that hanging over your head. Thank you all. They just rang the cowbell, so I've got to switch to my next table. I wish you all very good luck, and thank you for talking with me. Hi. I am... Abby Breitman, and I'm the postdoctoral fellow that was in the panel. Um, I'm currently on a two-year position, a two-year grant. I got my own funding to fund my own postdoc, but that's rare. Usually somebody else hires someone. Um, they get funding for a big project and they want somebody else to run it for them, and they're willing to train that person in professional development and things like that. Um, so that, I would say, is a more common experience. But knowing that, what questions can I answer for you guys about postdoctoral fellowships? Um, I'm in the psychology department. My project is very research specific. I'm looking at college student drinking um, and looking at interventions and correlations and the etiology behind it. So that's my field. Um, but I'm also an expert in statistics. So at the same time, I'm collaborating with a lot, of, a lot of other researchers in more tangential projects that aren't exactly in line with mine. Um, so that's my specific project. 
And I should say fellowships are about running a specific project, whether it's yours or someone else's, and um, you're also getting trained. So if you create your own postdoc, you have to come up with a training plan for what you need. And if you go somewhere else, they should be training you both in your field and in professional development. Um, okay, my postdoc was not my original plan. I was hoping to get a tenure track faculty position somewhere that did both research and teaching. But it was a close plan B. Um, teaching somewhere at like a community college where it was very teaching focused or going to a peer research institute where I had to do one or the other. That was further down as like plans C and D. So the postdoc is a, a close way to do still both research and mentoring. And it buys a little time for the job market to bounce back. Um, so when I was finishing my PhD, I applied to both postdocs and faculty positions at the type of place I want to work. And um, when I didn't get the faculty positions with my tiny Vita, um, the postdoc came through, thank goodness. And it gives me a chance to expand my Vita so I can get the position I want eventually. Um, I am working toward tenure track. That is my eventual goal, somewhere that balances research and teaching. Um, if I have to choose just one when the postdoc is over, I will choose research. I'd say I like that better than just teaching. Um, but ideally, I'll still try to find a way to do both. And if I go to a research institute, I could still potentially teach a class here and there at a community college. Um, so that was whether or not it was the original plan. It is a way toward that tenure track goal. I'll be an entry level person, just like somebody who just finished their PhD, but I'll have had two years of building my Vita compared to them, which makes me um, look more experienced and hopefully more desirous to committees that are deciding who to hire. So, you know, if I go up against essentially me from two years ago, my Vita is several pages longer. I've got more mentorship. I've got more pubs. I've got more conference presentations. Um, and so it gets me toward that tenure track position goal. But even if you don't want to be faculty somewhere, if you want to go into a peer research field um, or any applied field, you get that applied experience. So you don't have to just look at postdocs if you're interested in um, a tenure track position. People that are interested in going into the field might still benefit from a postdoctoral position. Do you guys have any other questions for me? Okay, well I can just talk more and you can let me know if more questions come up. Um, I'll say the the position I received is more rare, where I was able to fund my own postdoc. It's much more common for people to go work somewhere else. Um, somebody got a grant, they need somebody to run it, they hire a postdoc and agree to train them. Um, the way that you would look for those types of positions is in the same place where you would look for faculty positions. So in my field, I go to um, field-specific websites. I'm in APA. I'm sorry, I'm in psychology, so I would look at the APA website at APS, um, USA Jobs if you were interested in government positions, but anywhere you would go for your field for faculty positions, and that's also where they will advertise for postdoctoral positions. Or if you've joined listservs for your field, they might get sent out via email. So that's one way to find out about postdocs, if that's in a route you're interested in going. Most fellowships are between one to three years. Um, if it's somebody else advertising the position, they decide whether it's a one, two, or three year position, and it's probably based on the study they're conducting. If they need three years of help, it's a three year position. If they need one year of help, it's a one year position. If you fund your own like I did, I could choose, and I chose a two year position, um, partly because I thought two years would be sufficient to expand my Vita, and partly because you get paid more than a grad student, but you're not quite faculty money yet. Um, so I didn't want to do that third year of lower income if I didn't have to. I've found that faculty staff that I have been working with are incredibly supportive of my long-term long goals, but I think that's because my goals match what they wish for me. Um, I think a lot of faculty in my program, in my department, want people to go into tenure-track positions at research institutions like ODU. So, um, they 
really like that that's my goal and they want to help me along the way. I think if I told them I wanted to leave academia, they might be a little less supportive. Um, so I would, I, they would still help me in every possible way. I think they would just disapprove a little bit, but I don't think they would stop helping me or try less or anything like that. Um, I should also mention, because I stayed here, sometimes the faculty staff forget that my status has changed, and that won't happen elsewhere. If you go somewhere else, they know you're a postdoc from the beginning. When I go to conferences, I get, um, I feel like people listen a little more than when I was a graduate student, but because I work with a lot of the same faculty members I used to, they still think of me as a graduate student sometimes, and that can be detriment to staying in the same place. Um, a lot of postdocs are, in fact, a one-time thing. But I have certainly heard of people leaving one postdoc and going to another, especially if they start with one like mine, where they stayed in the same location. It's not rare, I would say, for people to go to a second postdoc that is elsewhere, where they work with new people. Um, I don't hear of it happening a lot, and I think that's just because people get tired of the smaller salary compared to full-time positions, um, but it's completely driven by you. Certainly if you apply for another postdoc and you've already had one, you would be more competitive than other people applying that haven't had one. Um, so if that's what you want to do, you certainly can. You just be aware the salary is going to be lower than completely independent positions. So my postdoc is considered a full-time, 40-hour-a-week or more position. Um, that being said, I am allowed to teach. I wasn't sure about this. Because it was considered a full-time job, I was worried that they wouldn't let me teach. So I called the people that funded me. I called my program manager at NIH and asked him if I was allowed to teach a class. And he actually had to check with some people. But he came back and said, as long as I'm able to do the postdoctoral work at least 40 hours a week, then there was no reason I couldn't teach above and beyond that. Um, they'll just want to make sure it doesn't hurt your current postdoc activities. So it's not hurting my study. Um, I didn't do it the whole time, but the first semester of my postdoc, I did continue to teach classes. And it was a great way for me to recruit students for my research lab, actually. So I'm really glad I did that. Um, but I would say that's less common. I think more people do focus on just the postdoc, um, just the research, or just their own personal training, rather than trying to teach at the same time. Um, so it's certainly possible, um, depending on who's funding your postdoc, you would just want to double check with them. But it's not ideal. I found that I was really, really busy when I was trying to do both. It's like holding two jobs. Oh, you're quite welcome. Um, I'm hoping that we will post our contact information, so if you guys have more questions later, you're welcome to email me um, once we send that out. Or you can look me up. My name is Abby Breitman. You can look me up in the ODU directory and send me an email that way, and I'll respond to you if you guys have any more questions later. But future plans, I hope to obtain a, a tenure-track position at an institution like ODU that balances research and teaching. Um, I know the job market isn't fantastic right now. They tend to replace tenure-track people with adjuncts at the moment. Um, but there's been a push for that to change. So that's plan A. Um, plan B, if I can't find something that blends the two, plan, plan B would be peer research. Plan C would be peer teaching. Um, even if I go to a research position, I could still teach a class on the side if I wanted to. Um, it would have to be an evening class. And compensation tends to be better in research than teaching. And my postdoc will help me obtain a research position probably not a purely teaching focused position. Um, my search was very specific. I looked only at those tenure track positions I mentioned. Um, so when I went on the job market as I was finishing my PhD, I looked at faculty positions that blended research and teaching and postdoc positions at the same time and I applied to both at the same time. Only if I hadn't obtained either then I would have looked at peer research positions. And the um, hiring process is a lot faster for those. You have to apply for faculty positions about a year before you would actually start working there. And if you guys have had jobs not in faculty positions, you know the other way goes a lot faster. So once I found out I didn't have a, a, a faculty position or postdoc position, that's when I would have hit the other job market. Um, my, my original search was not region specific. I looked 
essentially anywhere in the continental United States that had my ideal position. Um, that being said, once I had gotten offers, if offers came, then I would have cared more about the region. Um, but postdocs, as I mentioned, are brief. They're only one to three years. So if you do go that route, be aware you'll have to relocate twice. Um, I turned down a postdoc in Seattle when my funding came through for this one because it's easier to stay in the same place than to move, especially if you're married or you have children or any other reasons like that. Um, but it looks like my time is up. Thank you guys. And again, feel free to email me if you have any other questions later. Um, hi folks, I'm Robert Vitovich. I'm the Associate Dean in the College of Arts and Letters here at ODU. Okay, so let me um, tell you a bit about my background. I bring to this conversation the experience of a faculty member who's also um, working as an administrator. And my bio briefly is that um, what I've told the other tables is I started kindergarten one year and I never left school. So essentially I've been in the academic cycle for many, many years and I really, really enjoy it and I can't think of a um, career that's been more satisfying. So um, I essentially started here at Old Dominion as an assistant professor, uh, was promoted and tenured happily, uh, became an associate professor, and then suddenly uh, one day I was asked if I would consider running for department chair, and from department chair then went on uh, to become associate dean. And it's the kind of um, story that is um, not really typical in that, you know, I've had opportunities and um, they've been good ones and I've taken advantage of them, but it's not anything I planned for. So if I could offer advice uh, that um, would, I think, benefit all of you the most is that as you're thinking about an academic career, think in terms of not just your first job, but what do I want to do in five years? What do I want to do in 10 years, 20, 30, and so forth? Because essentially, it's not going to stay the same. Uh, what you're doing when you first come out of graduate school will differ significantly from what you're doing 20 years out. And uh, as you stay engaged and as you take advantage of opportunities, uh, that's where I think you'll find um, career fulfillment. So um, enough of me talking. Uh, do you have questions? OK, good question. Um, this is from Stephanie. Am I still teaching? And how do I balance uh, my positions? OK, uh, so yes, I still teach. One class a semester. And um, my field, I should say, is art history. Um, and so. I generally try to teach one undergraduate class and then one graduate course. And um, I like being in the classroom because it does take me away from my computer and from my desk. And I get to see students still. OK, for Marty, um, how would I compare the expectations of an admin position to a teaching position? Uh, it's a little different. In a faculty position, you are evaluated annually by your department chair and it's based on a combination of your uh, teaching evaluations through uh, the student process but also a portfolio review um, an evaluation of your research so how much have you been um, how have you been active in terms of presenting at conferences and publishing papers and um, in my field it would be articles and books and also what are your service responsibilities so in terms of the department um, how much advising do you do? Uh, what kinds of committees do you sit on? And um, do you exert some kind of leadership role either in the department or in the college? With an administrative position, there's still an, eva an annual evaluation, but uh, we go uh, through a process that we call the self-evaluation. And that's a case where you sit down, you review what you've done for the year, you've listed your accomplishments, you present it in a narrative to your boss, in my case it would be the dean, and then the evaluation is based 
on that. And it's a slightly different process, but in some ways it's a bit more reflective uh, than what I had to do as a faculty member. Okay, so um, how would, let's see, there's a new question coming along. Uh, how do I balance work life with home social life? Um, it is, um, it is challenging. Now, I am not married, I don't have kids. So to a certain extent, that is a good thing, but also not a good thing in that, you know, I could spend more time working and I try not to, uh, to do that. Um, with an administrative position, there's a little less pressure to be, let's say, on all the time in terms of, you know, doing research in the lab or in the library. Um, but it's still there, and so it's, um, let's say it's, it's comparable to being a faculty member, maybe just a little bit less stressful because the expected output of research and publication is less. Let me ask, answer the, uh, the shorter question first um, from Selene. Uh, the question is, have I always worked at ODU? And actually, yes. Um, so I started when I was, uh, was very young, and I've been, uh, I've been here ever since. So right now, let's see, hmm, I think my 24th year. And I, I do like ODU. They treat me very well. Um, with the department chair position, was the research requirement relaxed then, too? And that's from Stephanie. Well, let's see. There's something called the workload analysis that um, is um, part of the evaluation of every faculty and every administrator. And I would say, as an administrator, you are not expected to be as productive a researcher, but you are expected to be active as a researcher. So that's the case for a department chair and also an associate dean is just recognize that instead of maybe producing you know six articles in five years or however many would be the norm um, you might be producing three um, or so um, generally with a department chair position there's still active teaching except in the very very largest departments and then in terms of the workload what you normally would spend on teaching is then shifted over to the administration category. I'm not sure if that answered your question, but um, it's a case essentially of um, uh, sort of uh, balances uh, that's built into the evaluation process. One thing um, you should be thinking about in terms of administration, um, if that is an interest, is what makes you happiest and then what is how much are you prepared to give in terms of a time commitment? And so let me um, go back to the example of being a department chair. Generally at a university, a department chair's term might be three years. Sometimes it's extended to six years. Uh, my time's almost up, but I'll wrap up here. Recognize that if you are enthused about being a department chair and you want to go on for the second term, you can have a really um, full and fulfilling, I should say, an active role in shaping the direction of the department. If you know that your skills are not in administration, but you're still asked or elected to be department chair, <laughs> recognize that you can do it for three years, do a good job, but also then return to the classroom because at that point you have you know, fulfilled your responsibilities, uh, but you are not committed to doing it for life. So I hope that's um, um, good advice and uh, it's been a pleasure and I'm, I'm glad I've had this opportunity to see how uh, we do the, um, the distance component of this. It's been, uh, it's been very interesting and thank you. All right everybody, Brian Payne had to leave. Um, he had another engagement so unfortunately you guys are stuck with me uh, but I, some of you are some of my students so I, I'll kind of give you a quick heads up. And before I came to ODU, I actually did a one-year administrative postdoc, so I'd be more than happy to talk about the trade-offs um, that I had to make in, in deciding whether to stay on as a postdoc and an administrative position or tenure track, or I'd be more than happy to answer any specific questions you guys have. Okay, the trade-offs. So let me begin with um, 
I started my administrative postdoc at the same institution where I got my PhD. So I was in the Martin School of Public Policy, but at the same time, I was working as, as a research scientist, but then uh, that obviously wasn't enough to pay the bills. So there was an administrative postdoc in the College of Business that was open that I applied for, and um, I, was, I became a, an administrative postdoc in the Dean's Office for the College of Business. And it was a really interesting position where I worked on assessment, I worked on faculty evaluation, I worked on accreditation and, and site visit reviews. So it was, it was very much a hands-on administrative position. It was a two-year postdoc, and they gave me the option of staying if I didn't find a job. Unfortunately, I did. Um, and, and so I, you know, I was considering my tenure-track position at ODU at the time, and I went to the dean, and he says, "Well, it is a one year. You have one more year as a postdoc, but we really like what you're doing. We'd be really happy to ha bring you on as part of a full-time administrative uh, staff, part of the assessment team in the College of Business." So basically, that would have meant I was trying to decide between a full-time administrative position and a full-time tenure-track position, and. Academia is kind of weird and has its quirks, and, I, and unfortunately, I, uh, you've probably seen some of this, and, and I'll be the first to admit it, in academia, unfortunately, we are snobs. Faculty can be snobs. We sometimes look down on people who don't have PhDs who tell us what to do. So sometimes, uh, and I was on the receiving end of this as an administrative postdoc, where I would go to a full-time faculty member or say, you know, I need your assessment results for this, this, and this, or I need your credentials for this, this, and this, and it was not taken very kindly to, well, who is this person who doesn't have a PhD and is telling me what he or she needs? Um, so kind of recognizing some of that in academia and knowing at that point that I would be entering an administrative position without tenure and without that credibility with senior faculty, I wasn't sure how effective I could be as a fac as an administrator within that faculty setting. Now, this is brand new news. I did get tenure, and so I, I, I think now my perception, having had, having now, well, I will be, having received tenure, I think. Uh, my approach to administration might be a little bit different. I'd be a lot more confident and comfortable being in an administrative position. So those were kind of, I think, the, the key trade-offs that I had to consider. Um, surprisingly, salary-wise, the administrative position and the tenure-track position were very similar in um, compensation. The other, I think, deciding factor was I love doing research. I love it with a passion. And with assessment, there's a lot of analysis that I could do, and I enjoyed it. But there wasn't that flexibility to pursue the research that I wanted to do, the questions that I thought was interesting. And so with this particular uh, tenure track position, you know, there, was, there would be a lot more flexibility to pursue research that was interesting and relevant to me. So those were kind of some of the some of the trade-offs. I, I think the biggest thing for me was I was not particularly thrilled with the con with the idea of teaching. I did not come from a strong teaching background, and so any additional teaching expectations were a little worrisome for me. Um, so that was also part of the calculus as well. What was I passionate about? I was passionate about the research. I actually enjoyed administration, which was surprising because I could be a little scatterbrained and not very detail-oriented, but I actually enjoyed the administrative side of the equation. But for me, it was the opportunity to do research that really kind of tipped the balance. In an ideal world, I think I would probably, if it was, I, in an ideal world, I would love to be a pure researcher. So. Um, Marty asks, how does the administrative advancement work? Um, there's a lot of administrative advancement that does happen in-house. So, for example, within a department, um, there might be the need for a department chair. Here at ODU, the department chair is a three-year term, um, and then you, the, with the opportunity typically to stay on for a maximum of six years. Um, so there's that kind of advancement. Um, there's also kind of in-house in advancement, for example, within uh, – if they're looking for an associate dean or assistant dean. Just last year in the College of Business, 
or two years ago, we hired or we brought on a new associate dean from in-house. But that's not to say that there are not outside, uh, we don't bring outside people. It just depends, I think, sometimes on um, upper administration, senior leadership preferences for in-house versus uh, outside candidates. I think administrative-wise, it really does kind of depend on a lot of kind of contextual factors that could potentially change um, the equation. So I think, I, Marty, I'm hopeful that I answered your question. Okay. Um, in the in the meantime, oh, okay. So I have a full teaching load. Yes, I do. <laughs> how do I balance work and family? And how do I choose ODU? Both of those questions come into play. I think both at the same time. One is research is my passion. So when I guess get stressed out with service or administration or when I get stressed out with teaching, um, guess what? I do research. Um, so it's kind of that stress valve for me. So it's, it's really not as much a balancing issue as it is um, I do it to get uh, the relief that I need. So um, I chose ODU partly because of the location. I'll be perfectly honest. It's all about location. Um, but now that I've been here, I really enjoy being here. So anyway, the, the last bell has rung. It's time to leave. Thank you so much for participating. I appreciate it. The um, next slide here has information about the survey.